So I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker, David Lang. David is an entrepreneur, a maker, a writer, a pioneer and advocate of open source underwater robotics and sensors. He is the co-founder of Open ROV and so far Ocean Technologies and on a mission to create pervasive sensor networks to understand and monitor the ocean. David is also NOAA's exploration uh, on NOAA's Ocean Exploration Advisory Board, a TED Senior Fellow, and a National Geographic Emerging Explorer. David, thank you very much for joining us today. The floor is yours. All right. Well, thanks, Seth um, and, and Fado for having me. I, I'm really excited about this event. I also have to thank you for putting me on the following probably one of the hardest, pan, uh, hardest acts to follow. Uh, this whole panel has been just really incredible to, to listen to. And I'm, I think I'm going to be saying a lot of the same things. Um, to start, I want to tell a short story. So this is a photo from 2013, where my teammate Eric Stackpole and I attended a NOAA conference called Ocean Exploration 2020. And it was really similar to this event in that it was a meeting of the minds. It was the leaders in the ocean community who came uh, together for a few days of visioning about what that future would hold. And we were there talking about open ROV, which was our low cost design for open source remotely operated vehicles. And I think the crowd at the time was really split on um, you know, whether this was a good idea. I think there was excitement and doubt. Uh, a number of folks thought it was, was you know, probably wasn't even possible. And the other half were, were really excited about the possibilities. But you know, either way, the idea was now on the table. And that idea was that there could be really caught, low cost distributed um, devices. And that would be kind of a potential alternative future for ocean technology. We'd seen this happening in terrestrial aerial space systems, but it hadn't really taken hold in the ocean. You know, kind of fast, fast forward a little bit. Um, we continued to build more capable and accessible devices. This was the Trident, um, which created an entire industry of small underwater drones. If you're curious about the effect these devices had, just Google underwater drones and you can see the plethora of options that are now available. Um, but uh, we're taking those ideas even further. And in the beginning of 2019, we teamed up with uh, Tim Jansen and Evan Shapiro to create So Far Ocean Technologies, which is an even bigger and bolder effort to solve the ocean undersampling problem that Margaret talked about. We want to, the mission of the company is to truly connect uh, the world's oceans. And our main product is Spotter. It's a connected marine weather buoy. And it, Again, building on those themes, orders of magnitude more affordable, really easy to deploy, compact and robust. Um, here was a graphic from a paper um, last year that shows kind of the evolution of this technology, right? On the left is the, the kind of existing weather buoys, and you can see our spotter buoy on the right. It's about the size of a basketball. Um, and our users are taking advantage of this versatility to create coastal monitoring networks that they really wouldn't have been able to before. And we recently announced a new smart mooring. Um, so people are able to add additional sensing capabilities uh, throughout the water column, which is really exciting. And as a company, we've set an even bigger goal. We're creating a global network of these spotters um, uh, around the world. You can go to weather.sofar weather.sofarocean.com to see uh, where our grid, how our grid is growing. But there's a couple hundred of these out there now, and that's going to grow to a couple thousand uh, by next year. And, and we're doing this for a purpose. Um, and we're already seeing dramatic improvements in marine weather forecasting, which has big implications for science and industry, especially when you think about the effects it could have on um, marine shipping efficiency. But I want to zoom out a little bit and address the, the bigger issues that are being kind of put forth by the organizing committee about what we can do to move the entire ocean technology and science community forward. Because I think we can do better uh, than we've done in the past seven years since we last met at that Oceans 2020 event. And I don't think we have to look too far. I think we can really just copy and paste, imitate what's been done in the space industry, which is currently booming. I think we can use that blueprint to start a, a technology. And this is the formula uh, as I see it. And I think it's pretty simple. And the, the first thing is overcoming the right bottlenecks. So the bottleneck to space sensing was launched. And I think the bottleneck 
to ocean distributed ocean sensing is integration. Kind of, you know, along the lines of what the other panelists are saying, especially with Margaret, in terms of creating that the internet of the internet of things. Um, because this is the reality of where we are. This is the state of ocean technology. It's an expensive and it's a failure prone mess. Um, you know, we've got connectors of every shape and size, cylinders and wires. And every time you do an integration between a sensor and a platform, it requires a team of electrical, mechanical, and software technicians to get right. And we can do better than this. Um, and even, you know, again, looking at the space program, there's a formula for this. They did this with CubeSats. So I, I know many of you are familiar with the CubeSat story, but it's worth going over it again. Um, the CubeSat standard was created by two professors um, as, a, as a design spec that they hoped would give their students a way to launch their own designs. It was a simple 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter shape um, with the host of mechanical and electrical requirements. But the real innovation was the Peapod launcher. Right? They designed a safe way for these small satellites to piggyback on existing rocket launches. It was truly a disruptive innovation, as, as Bob was saying. I mean, this changed the way the space industry has gone about things. On the top right here, you can see the graph of all of these new constellations that are planned. You know, the, the CubeSat model shifted the paradigm from large, expensive, exquisite systems to low cost and distributed. It's now constellations of cooperating systems. And you can see on the bottom right, the number of launches that are continuing to grow by you know, science, military, um, companies. It's, it's helped everybody. Um, and it's also had a profound effect on industry. Um, you can see in the graph on the top right of um, all the, the new companies being started every year that are building off of this standard. And I've seen this firsthand. The bottom right photo is a picture of our old roommates um, who had run an experiment at NASA to see if they could put the sensors on their phone into a CubeSat to generate imagery. And they did. And they were successful. And they started building their first satellites right there in that garage. And they have built that company to a, into a multi-billion dollar you know, effort called Planet Labs. And they're getting an image of every location on earth every day. And we got to see that from, from the garage startup uh, lens and it's pretty special. And that's what I think we should be aiming for here is creating a type of on-ramp where simple garage prototypes can quickly evolve into scalable solutions um, and companies. I, you know, we're hearing a lot about autonomy, um, but what we have to do is we really have to put the right ingredients in place to see that really blossom. I don't think we've, we've even begun to see what's possible there. Um, and so that's it, that's the, that's the proposal. I think this group is, is someone who can really um, take these ideas and put them into action. I think it fits with, with what every, everyone is saying, right? I think this idea of convergence really fits for this group because what we're all talking about is, is different slices of, of the same pie, this kind of really evolving the ocean technology and, and scientific landscape to solve 21st century problems. And I just wanna end on, on one last story. So this is um, kind of speaks to the why of this potential future. And this is a new initiative called Aqualink. And I encourage you to, to go check it out. It's aqualink.org. And they're creating a global coral monitoring system by combining some of our tools that so far, but with, with other tools and putting them in the hands of citizen scientists and reef managers around the world. You know, Don was talking about this living atlas. It's great to have the dashboards. The dashboards matter, but we have to get the sensing capability out there. And we need low cost sensors to do that. And it's really important. What I love about what Aqualink is doing is they're involving people. They're involving the reef managers. They're involving the citizen scientists because we have to continue to close the loop to get people to care and to um, understand what's happening to our world. Um, so they're gonna be launching their web app in the next few days. Um, and I think it's really a glimpse of what kind of important conservation can be work, in, important conservation work can be done when we apply the best tools and the best minds. Um, and in order to do this, in order to address the, the major ocean challenges we're facing, uh, we're gonna need a lot more of this. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to working with this group over the next couple of days to talk about how to accelerate it. And I'd love to talk to you personally. If you have questions or ideas for collaboration, just reach out. And if you want more information about so far, you can go to sofarocean.com. Thank you so much, David. This is uh, very exciting to hear. Um, 
I'd like to bring up, we have a number of questions on Slido from you. Uh, uh, I'm gonna try and thread a, a common theme that I see between them. Um, a number of folks are asking about how to integrate um, sort of your type of network from your spotter buoys with things like Argo floats or um, data from NOAA. And there's another uh, question about, um, do we need a prime directive for the oceans so that we are observing rather than influencing? Um, um, so, so separating those questions, um, the, I, I, again, I'll point to Aqualink because they're doing an amazing job integrating the ex, some of the existing infrastructure. Um, so NOAA has a great program called Coral Reef Watch, which is a satellite-based system that measures sea surface temperature around the world. And, um, but it's just the skin of the ocean, right? Which is not actually what's going on at the reef level. So what they're doing is they're creating a, a, a system using our smart mooring system where they have temperature at the surface and they're measuring temperature at the reef level. And they're correlating and they're creating a system that addresses coral bleaching uh, with all the best data that's around there. And they're involving people, right? So uh, I think that's a good example of ways to mix some of the existing data infrastructure and some of these new evolving tools. So that's what I would point to them if they want an example of how that could look. Um, and then the second question, uh, what was the second question again? Um, we have a question about um, with all the discussion of swarms and fleets of sensors, do we need a prime directive for the ocean so that we are observing rather than influencing? Um, it's a good question. I think when we look at the industries, the ocean industries of the past, um, you know, 100 years, it's been really extractive, right? Like fishing, oil and gas, all of these things. Um, and we need to move to a more kind of, re we need to move towards more regenerative um, ocean industries. And I think we're seeing glimpses of what that could be. I think there's some really great initiatives within aquaculture. I think the shipping uh, industry is is taking their role in a, in building a sustainable future really seriously, which is exciting to see. Um, so I think that the technology is is going to serve the science and it's going to serve the industry. So um, I think the the bigger question um, is can we build industries that um, are restorative and not extractive? And I think the only way to do that is to have uh, the technologies that um, look cheaper, more distributed technologies to do that. I think about, you know, Bob had that slide of uh, controlling um, their robots over telepresence. I mean, that's possible now with really low cost devices. And that's a really exciting uh, potential for, you know, virtual tourism um, that could be really safe and regenerative to the oceans and the communities that, um, that depend on them. So, you know, that's just an example of what kind of is possible with a with a, a different technology paradigm. So um, I think that's, that's a responsibility of all of ours um, to, to make sure that the next chapter um, is, is regenerative and not extractive. Fantastic. Thank you so much, David. We are going to take a short 10 minute break, um, at which point we will resume with our um, convergent sessions. Um, if you felt like you asked a question that didn't get answered, uh, I'd like to uh, guide you to us to our Slack channel where we will be um, copying all of the questions that you've asked on Slido um, into Slack. All right, thank you all very much and we'll see you in 10 minutes. <laughs>